please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Queen, this is the big breaking hour, breaking story at this hour. The larger shareholder in both Ola as well as Uber, Japanese giant SoftBank is calling for a merger between both the cab hailing companies in India. Sources in fact tell CNBC TV18 that Ola and SoftBank are actively pursuing this merger. Priya Shet, who has picked up this information, is here with the details. Priya, Uber has given a categorical denial. What are you picking up from your sources as to what SoftBank and Ola are looking at doing right now? Well, absolutely, Kitika. And what could be perhaps a significant deal in the online cab as we just space to go through, we understand from sources that Japanese investor SoftBank is mulling the merger of Ola and Uber India operations. Now, sources in both Ola as well as SoftBank have confirmed to us that talks are underway in pursuing Uber India for a merger. And the talks have been on for about 12 months now, but there are a number of issues that still need to be ironed out, like market control, possible PCI issues, and talks are also on with regards to controlling stake in the combined entity once the deal goes through. Now, do remember that Ola and Uber hold about 95% of market share in India. It's also pertinent to note at this point in time that Uber recently announced its exit from Southeast Asia after selling its local unit to Grab. So, therefore, at this point in time, uh, what we really pick up is that there's no clarity on the timeline of the deal. Talks are in very initial stages, and it could still take a couple of months before the deal goes through after several of these issues are sorted out. In fact, we did reach out to both the companies. While Ola said that they uh, will be in an active and integral part of India's journey, SoftBank and other investors are committed to realizing this ambition. Uber India has categorically denied talks of any acquisition or merger between the two companies. Okay, so this is something that we have picked up from our sources within SoftBank. This is something we understand Ola and SoftBank are pursuing at this point, but we haven't been able to get some clarity with respect to what Uber India stance is. Thank you so much, Priya, for taking us through that exclusive uh, breaking story at this hour. But to put this into perspective, we did speak to the Uber CEO, Dara Khursovafbawi, last month. Little did he mention about this news. Speaking to Shireen Bhan last month, he in fact said that they are not competing with Ola, but car ownership. And he reiterated back then that a competition with Ola is actually a healthy one. I want India to be our second tech center. You know, San Francisco is the headquarters, but India is going to be a very, very tech center. And who knows, maybe 10 years from now, India will be our first tech center. We'll see. How, what's the hiring plan here? <laughs> Multiples of where we are now. Multiples, Multiples of where we are. Where I'm pushing are our teams hard. You have an interesting situation in India where SoftBank is also the largest shareholder of your fiercest competitor, Ola. Yes. So how does, how does it all work? Uh, well, you'll have to ask them that question. Um, I, I think, listen, SoftBank is, is a very big picture investor. And when I talk uh, to Masa about his beliefs, Masa's core belief is that the ride-sharing space is a space that's going to grow. So I think SoftBank isn't thinking about Ola versus Uber. SoftBank is thinking about Ola and Uber versus car ownership, and I think that's a pretty darn good bet. But still, I mean, uh, from a practical perspective, you're competing with them in a market like India. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, SoftBank clearly putting big money into Ola as well, which it's using against Uber to compete in a market like India. What's the conversation th that you then have with Masa? But I view this as we're not spending against Ola, we're spending against car ownership. We are actually building mobility as a service, and I think our competing with Ola it's a healthy competition because it forces us to improve our product, it forces us to be innovative, it forces us to reduce prices, and ultimately that's going to come at the cost of car ownership. Remember, Ola and Uber together, as Priya was pointing, uh, pointing out, are 95% of the markets. So of course, a lot of issues to be ironed out before that actually goes through, but that's the big breaking story at this hour. The other story that we have been tracking all evening, we told you first, and it's now official. The government has cleared the runway for Air India's divestment. The government has, in fact, given its in-principle nod to sell 76% stake in the national carrier, that is Air India. The Aviation Ministry has released a preliminary information memorandum for inviting expression of interest from prospective bidders. The information memorandum details the terms and conditions for the divestment process. Uh, Ashweet Sethi is here with the details. Ashweet, take us through the fine print that's there in that long document. 
Yes, the government has taken the first step as far as divestment of the national carrier is concerned. Now, the three basic points that have come out of this detailed uh, bidding uh, process that has started is the first, of course, being the debt situation. Now, it is clear from the Deepam Seki statement that 33,000 odd crores will be passed on to the new bidder as far as debt and liability is concerned. 29,000 odd crores will be passed on in the SPV. It remains to be seen how much uh, will it impact, how many airlines will come forward because this has been one of the most contentious issues as far as the debt saga is concerned. The second point, of course, being 24% stake is what the government will be retaining. 76% will be offloaded. The third important point, again, being that as far as the whole issue of who will be able to bid, that the cap has been set at about 5,000 odd crores. The company must have that kind of turnover and also how the company must be profitable for past three years because the government wants to ensure that no non-profitable company comes forward as far as the uh, Air India uh, company is concerned. Now, we have to wait and see what happens next because, remember, bidders will be called and RFP will be issued by May and that is the sense that has been given. We'll have to get more clarity as to when does that happen. Okay, Ashri, thanks for joining in with that. Of course, we will take this discussion forward on India Business Hour, but moving on to an exclusive. The government has reached out to the Reserve Bank of India, raising their concerns on the new NPA framework. Now, the government wants the RBI to completely do away with the rule that requires banks to classify even a one-day delay in debt repayment as a default. Sapna Das is here to put this into perspective. Sapna, first Indian Banks Association writing to the RBI, requesting them to relax the one-day criteria. And now the government too has joined the chorus. Very clearly, uh, uh, you know, a very clear sense of disquiet coming in from the government quarters as far as the one-day default rule particularly is concerned under the uh, uh, new NPA framework of Reserve Bank. Uh, government, uh, it, it, what we understand is that government is in conversation with the banking regulator on this front to basically do away with this rule completely. Uh, the government's view is very clear that even for loans above 2,000 crores, there could be stress points, especially for sectors like power, for roads, for, for, for coal, uh, where a one-day default uh, you know, is quite possible uh, and can have significant implications. Even in terms of those loan sizes below 2,000 crores, well, uh, many a time the, the default can be technical in nature, uh, not necessarily uh, an actual default. So basically, government pitching for a complete doing away of this one-day default rule. Similarly, in terms of the earlier SEBI proposal also of uh, disclosing uh, within one working day uh, defaults to the exchanges, uh, well, that proposal has not really gone for for the time being, but there also, uh, you know, the government is not in favour. So we have to really wait and watch and see what happens on this front, uh, whether the RBI plays ball with the government and this one-day default rule, at least for starters, is done away with. Okay, Sapna, thanks for joining in with that. We will take a quick commercial break, but coming up on the other side, no decision by the SEBI board on trading ban on companies and to NCLT, but the market regulator accepts 40 recommendations by the Kotak panel on corporate governance reforms. Many more areas cleared. We'll tell you which those are after the break. Welcome back to What's Hot. Now, important developments coming in from the banking space today. So let's start with news from ICICI Bank, where the board has expressed full faith in Chief Executive Chanda Kochar. Now, that statement from ICICI Bank comes in the wake of concerns surrounding the sanction of loans to Vidicon Industries and alleged loans to a firm founded by Mrs. Kochar's husband. To get exact context to the story and clarity on the ICICI Bank statement, let's go across to Lata Venkatesh, who's pretty much been here all evening. Lata, ICICI Bank clarified that none of the investors of New Power Renewables, which is the company founded by Mrs. Kochar's husband, are borrowers of ICICI Bank. Quickly give us the context to this and what are the implications now? Well, actually, uh, we had written a letter to uh, uh, ICICI Bank uh, uh, with distinct questions uh, asking whether all the insinuations in the public domain are right or wrong. And it looks like the press release is a public uh, answer to our uh, uh, questionnaire to them. So let me just quote some of the questions. Uh, one of the questions we posed and which perhaps is on many investors' mind, uh, has ICSI board probed the charge that the bank sanctioned loans to Videocon as a quid pro quo for loans given by Videocon to uh, 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 Mr. T uh, Ms. Chanda Kulchar's husband. Now, the answer of very clearly is no question of any quid pro quo nepotism as is being alleged. So that's clearly what they are saying 
in their letter. Uh, the next question, the question we asked them was, Ms. Kochar involved in the sanctioning of loans to uh, the video con uh, group companies? And they, went, they go on to say, and in a very detailed fashion, the board has a very well-structured, standardized loan approval process. Large exposures are approved by a credit committee. That committee itself has a majority of independent board members. And the chairman of that committee is almost always a non-executive uh, member of the board. So it's not as if the top management of the bank or one individual can sanction uh, these loans. And then our question was, uh, uh, is ICSA Bank, sat the board, is the board and the chairman satisfied that Ms. Kocher was not conflicted while sanctioning these loans? And again, they say there's no question of any uh, um, uh, conflict of interest, as the rumours allege. The board has full confidence and reposes faith in the leadership uh, top management team and in the leadership of uh, uh, Chada Kocha. So really, you know, these the point I think the bank is making is no paper or uh, important media house has carried these insinuations, but they are there in the public domain. I mean, in the public domain, you, you can access the letter written by one Arvind Gupta uh, uh, the uh, 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 piece that uh, appeared on infralive.com uh, about 18 months back. Mm. All this is there in the public domain, but they have not had a chance to reply because no newspaper or media house uh, uh, you know, brought it up. So they've chosen to just clarify those, uh, probably in response to the questionnaire we sent them. Okay, so that's a very important clarification coming. But Lata, you also broke the story on uh, PNB, perhaps looking at uh, honouring all letters of undertaking and foreign letters of credit, and that news has been confirmed by the bank. What are you picking up? Uh, well, uh, we did uh, hear uh, yesterday night itself that uh, uh, from bankers that uh, PNB has agreed to honour all the LOUs and the letters of credit. Uh, and today, the same was confirmed by the bank itself in writing. The, all that the bank has sought is that uh, the uh, um, uh, lending banks, banks which honoured their LOUs, should give an undertaking that uh, if any of their own employees are found, uh, you know, uh, found to have faulted any of the rules, then they should repay the money. And uh, therefore, they have uh, now given a statement that they have settled 352 LOUs and foreign letters of credit and the total amount is 6,500 crore. A doubt may arise that the total fraud was 13,000. How come 6,500? These are 6,500 crore of LOUs which mature in the current financial year. So obviously, if these are, then those that are maturing in the next financial year will also be honoured. Uh, we do not know how they will be provisioned. We do not know whether they have time to provision. Uh, if it is treated as an operational fraud, then they will have to uh, provision everything in the uh, current year itself. But if it is an advances fraud, then there have been instances in the past when the RBI has given more time for provisioning. Okay, fair enough, Lata. Thanks for breaking those uh, important stories for us. So let's move on to another story that broke earlier today. We told you first that it's now been confirmed. Fortis and Manipal have announced a large transaction. Manipal hospitals will merge with Fortis Healthcare's hospital business, giving way to a listing of the company. Now, this will make Manipal hospitals one of the largest hospital chains in the country with a pan-India presence. Manipal, in, in fact, is backed by Marquee private equity firm TPG, which is infusing 3,900 crore rupees in the transaction. Manipal will also buy a controlling stake in Fortis Health's diagnostics chain, SRL. The transaction could take a year and will make Fortis uh, just uh, a holding company for SRL with about 36% stake. Nisha Podar is here with exclusive, uh, with the details that she broke earlier. Nisha, what are you picking up? The deal announcement has turned out to be quite an eventful affair as far as the Fortis Healthcare shareholders are concerned. Look at the stock price and uh, the basic reason why the stock plummeted like this could be the valuation um, you know, mismatch that the shareholders had with the final deal contours. So the swap ratio that we are talking about, 100 is to 10.83, puts an equity valuation of about 7,100 crore rupees for Fortis Healthcare, which is at a 10% and discount to the 7,800 market cap at which the company closed its trading session on 27th of March, a day before the deal signing. Now, remember that Edelweiss Brokerage uh, has also come up with a report, a negative report on this transaction, saying that it will be difficult for this particular transaction to go through. And they have also mentioned that first the valuation is lower and the second one that uh, Fortis Healthcare becoming a holding company of SRL because it's selling 
selling away 20% stake to Manipal Hospitals, which has a controlling majority, will attract holding company discount. So this, along with the valuations of this transaction, both put together, have really substantially plummeted this stock. It was down over 13% today, with a market cap of close to 6,400 crore rupees, so an erosion of almost 1,400 crore rupees of market cap in a single day as a knee-jerk reaction to this particular transaction. We'll have to see how it goes going forward, but remember that this this entire consummation will take some time, about 12 months. It also requires a shareholder's approval, and that will be the key also for this demerger process and this transaction to go through. Some of the other concerns could also be the alleged fund diversion case. Lutra and Lutra report has to come out. SFI or SEBI investigations are on, and one has to still see whether the legal triangle that Daichi and Singh Brothers are having will have any bearing on this company, even though Singh Brothers hardly own any stake now. And and are no more the promoters of Fortis Healthcare. Looking ahead for the company, uh, considering this whole deal goes, uh, all goes on as has been uh, envisaged, well, Fortis Healthcare will get 720 crores as well as 1,000 crores by way of the two transactions could be utilized for its uh, debt uh, repayment and also for working capital requirements. And the new avatar of uh, Ma Manipal Hospitals will have almost 38% stake from the promoters, um, Ranjan Pai and uh, TPG, which has given a huge backing of close to 4,000 4, crore rupees, this transaction would hold over 20% stake. Temasek, Yes Bank, will they stay or not? That needs to be going forward. Several questions to be answered and deal consummation will take some time and that process will be closely watched out. Okay, Nisha, thanks for that. Now, market regulator SEBI's board met for the last time in this financial year. At that crucial meeting, it took a slew of decisions, including permission to exchanges to introduce co-location facilities on a shared basis. SEBI also accepted 40 recommendations by the Kotak panel on corporate governance reforms. However, no decision was taken on trading ban on companies set to NCL. That's just a portion of what was uh, discussed and cleared today. They have also reduced the cost for mutual fund players from about 20 basis points to 5 basis points. Several important areas. They have uh, increased uh, the risks on non-compliance. Uh, so we will take this discussion forward and the details forward on India Business Hour. But we will have to wrap up this edition of What's Hot. Thank you very much for watching. But up next is uh, our special show on Focus on Markets. Today was the last trading day of this fiscal and week. Global queues added to the expiry pressure on the last day. The Nifty managed to hold on to the 10,100 mark, but the Sensex slipped over 200 points to end below the 33,000 mark. Markets today will take with the last day's action forward on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be back in 30 minutes with the top stories of the day.